Amen. All right, keep your hand here in Hebrews chapter number 7, or you can slide a bulletin in there if you would like. <clears throat> And also turn to, in your left hand, the Old Testament, Genesis chapter number 14. Genesis chapter number 14 is actually where <clears throat> this, uh, this story in Hebrews 7 uh, um, takes place. Is Genesis chapter number 14. <clears throat> This morning I'm going to be preaching on the doctrine of tithing. Now I had mentioned a few weeks ago that I was going to preach on this particular doctrine. This was when we had taken up the charity offering and, and uh, the church has been in existence about two years now. <clears throat> I preached uh, two sermons on that were dedicated to offerings and givings. Both of them took place on the day that we take up the offering. So we only do that one time a year. <clears throat> So I dedicated those two sermons uh, once each year for the annual charity offering. And both times I remember mentioning that I wanted to preach on tithing at one point because this is a biblical doctrine. And, uh, you know, people, when you preach about givings, and I mentioned this just a few weeks ago, you know, people get all up in arms. People get, you know, they, they bristle. You know, it bothers them. <clears throat> and here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the doctrine of tithing or not. Because people don't like talking about giving, period. So, yeah, people can say that, you know, they're the, you know the, the people that are against tithing that will complain oftentimes when you talk about tithing, those same people complain if you talk about giving. And the reason why is because oftentimes those people are greedy. That's why it bothers them when you talk about giving. Now, here's the thing. Giving to the local church, giving to God's house, giving to God, these are biblical concepts. They're found in the Bible, and if it bothers you, then that's too bad. Just like if I preached on adultery and that bothers you. Just like I preached on any subject and that bothers you. It doesn't matter. It's a biblical topic, and the, the preacher is commanded to preach in season and out of season. No matter what subject it is. We live in America today where people are very wealthy, where people have a lot of money and because of that money means a lot to them. That's why this is one of the most sensitive subjects in Baptist churches or in all churches in America is because people have a greedy heart to some degree. I don't preach on this all the time. All the time. I said that to say this. I don't preach on this often. This will be the third sermon in the two years of our church's existence that I've dedicated for this topic. Uh, the, the first one was the charity offering. The second one was the charity offering the next following year. So an entire year went by. I almost never mention it. And then this morning I'm going to be preaching on the subject of tithing. It's a biblical topic. I've touched on it a lot. And because I've touched on it, you know, maybe I'd say ten times, you know, in varying sermons. So I've mentioned it in other sermons a few times, just not dedicated a full sermon to it. I want to go ahead and make sure that I preach a, the, a, a, a sermon that is a teaching on the subject of tithing. People have a lot of questions about tithing. And I want to try to answer some of those questions. Now... <clears throat> We have tithing mentioned here in Hebrews chapter number 7 and in Genesis chapter number 14. As I said, the story that's talked about in Hebrews 7 is actually, uh, actually took place and is first recorded in Genesis chapter number 14. And Hebrews 7 is referencing back to Genesis chapter number 14. <coughs> so first let's look at Hebrews chapter number 7. Beginning in verse number 1, it says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, of course, Melchizedek is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice here that it tells us that Abraham gave a tenth part, and then it says this, of all. That answers a few questions that I'm going to raise here in just a moment, and then also answer. It says this in verse 3, "...without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually." <clears throat> Verse 4, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. So notice <coughs> verse number 2, it says that he gave a tenth of all, a tenth part of all. Verse number 4, it says that he gave the tenth of the spoils. Now go to verse 5, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the of the priesthood have a commandment to take, and then it says this, tithes of, tithes, I'm sorry, of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren, though, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Verse 6, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham 
and blessed him that had the promises. I want to start out because as I said, I'm, this is going to be heavy on teaching. I'm going to be teaching the doctrine of tithing. I want to start out by defining what does tithe mean? What does the word tithe actually mean? Notice in this passage that it says he gave him a tenth twice. Then in verse number 6, it says that he received tithes of Abraham. So what is a tithe? A tithe is a tenth. That's all that the word tithe means. It means the tenth percent of something, the tenth of something. He received tithes from him. Now let's go back and actually read this story in Genesis chapter number 14. We can also learn this by comparing Scripture with Scripture here. Look at Genesis chapter number 14. <coughs> I want you to look with me at verse number 16. <clears throat> and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot <coughs> and his goods and the women also and the people. As soon as he brought back all the goods, everything it mentions. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedar Laomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. <coughs> And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. <clears throat> And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And then it says this, And he gave him tithes of all. So now we see tithes being used again. We saw tenth, tenth, right? It described it as what was being given from Abraham till Melchizedek twice as a tenth. Then it said tithes also in Hebrews 7. We look up the passage. We read about it in Hebrews or I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter number 14, the Old Testament. And I want you to notice that it says that what <coughs> Abraham gave to Melchizedek was tithes. Now, <coughs> another question that I want to go ahead and answer right now is what do we tithe on? So this will be kind of early on, some basic answers. You know, what do we tithe on? What does the Bible teach that you tithe on, right? Uh, uh, how, how, what do you pay the 10% of? So notice there, <clears throat> three different times we see the goods being, being spoken of. So he says in verse number 16, and he brought back, notice this, all the goods. All the goods. So notice it's referring to everything that he has, right? It, it mentions everything that he has. <coughs> Look at verse number 20. It says, And he blessed, and, and be, and blessed, I'm sorry, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Then it says this, And he gave him tithes of all. So notice it mentions he's bringing everything with him, and then it says that he gave him tithes of all. So he tithed on everything. Back in Hebrews chapter number 7, we saw the exact same thing mentioned. <clears throat> it says in verse number 2, this is not coincidental, incidental or accidental, it's very clear to say, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So notice he's taking one tenth of everything that he acquired. This is his increase. This is something that he did not have. These are new goods that he has acquired and then if you were to break all of his increase, all of these additional things that he now has been given, he pays one-tenth of that to or gives one-tenth of that to Melchizedek. <clears throat> this is also again mentioned in, uh, well, verse number four it just says, gave the tenth of the spoils. But if you look down, I believe it's verse number six, he says, but he whose descent is not counted from, from them received tithes of Abraham and bless him that had the promises. Um, I, I thought that it mentioned one more time. I, I believe it does, but I'm not exactly sure what's at. So, but we have four mentions there, four different mentions where it's very clear to tell us that he pays tithes of all. He pays tithes of all of it, of everything. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 14, verse number 22. Deuteronomy chapter number 14, verse number 22. <clears throat> And we are going to be uh, uh, looking at some of these passages a couple of different times. Deuteronomy chapter number 14, <clears throat> verse number 22. So notice what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter number 14, verse number 22. And this is the, the commandment within the law. It's, he's uh, pointing out a specific detail about when they bring their tithe. Look at what it says in verse number 22. Thou shalt truly tithe 
all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth <coughs> year by year. So I want you to notice that the tithe here is to be a tenth part of all your increase. Now there he mentioned specifically of the seed. Now the tithe is to be taken not only of the plants and, and the herbs and all of their you know, different grains and things along that line, the barley harvest, all of that, but the tithe is also to be taken, that is a tenth part is to be taken from their oxen, from the lambs, you know, the sheep, everything. There's supposed to be a 10% of all of your increase. So to answer the question, people would wonder like, hey, <coughs> what should I tithe on? On what should I give a 10%? Well, what the Bible teaches is that you should tithe on or give a 10% of any of your increase in any, way, in, in any way where the Lord has blessed you. And that's why I believe that it should be of all of your increase because God obviously is the one that blesses us with the goods that we have in this life. And it just makes sense that we would give the tenth of that. Now I'm going to get more into why it's specifically a tenth and, and all of that in just a moment. But that's why it's a tenth of all your increase. God's blessing you with an increase. So of course we should give back unto God. And it is a tenth that we should give. So how much or, or, or what in our lives should we tithe on? And the Bible teaches that we should tithe on all of our increase. In any way where you have been blessed or benefited in your life, uh, you know, financially, if you will, or, or with goods, however you would like to look at this and interpret this, this is what it means. Any way that you have been increased in this life or you have increased in this life, you should tithe on that. You should give a 10% on that. That is what the Lord teaches in the Bible. So <clears throat> now go with me to, let's go to uh, Leviticus. Actually, let's go to Genesis chapter 28, verse number 22 first. Let's go to Genesis chapter number 28, verse number 22. So we know what a tithe is. We, we know that that is a 10%. We know what we are supposed to tithe on. That is on the increase. We saw that being mentioned in the, the first passage there. And then also saw it clarified in Deuteronomy chapter number 14. Uh, we're going to have a couple of things answered here in Genesis chapter number 28. We have tithing mentioned again. One thing that I want to point out to you is that people were tithing uh, long before the law was ever given. People were, people were giving their tithe. A lot of people think like, well, when, <coughs> when, the old covenant <coughs> when the Old Covenant ceased or the Old Testament ceased, then tithing ceased. That's not true because the old the uh, the tith tithing in the Bible, the subject of tithing, transcends the old covenant. It was before the old covenant. The old covenant or the old testament was given at Mount Sinai. That is when the old covenant or the old testament began. Um, Abraham was long before the old covenant. Abraham was long before the Old Testament, and we see him himself giving a tenth unto the Lord. He gives it to, and I want to point this out, if you will, a minister of the Lord. He gives it to the Lord, yes, but he's playing the role of the priest in this sense. He's coming in, he's, the, he's referred to as the priest. He gives it to the minister of the Lord. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Look at Genesis chapter number 28, verse number 22. It says this, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Notice again that it stresses this over and over again. And when we study the, the word tenth or tithe, almost every time it's mentioned it says, all that God has given me. Whatever God has given me, we give a tenth. This is also, we see, him mentioning tithing. Now this is long before the Old Covenant. It's long before the Old Testament. So we can see Jacob now, that is who is being discussed here, uh, speaking about giving a tenth or giving a tithe. I'm going to go back to this in just a moment, but notice it also said this, <coughs> and this stone, <coughs> which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. So where does he give the tithe here? It says that he gives it to God's house, or he gives the tenth to God's house. Again, long before the Old Covenant, or long before the Old Testament. I want you to turn with me to Leviticus chapter number 27, verse number 30. Leviticus chapter number 27, verse number 30. This is where we're going to see the tithe instituted in the Old Testament. <clears throat> The tithe was uh, instituted in the Old Covenant is what I'm referring to. Not Old Testament scriptures, but specifically once it was put into the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. <clears throat> uh, Leviticus chapter number 27, verse number 30. <clears throat> it says this, <coughs> And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, 
is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Now we get quite a few things answered from this particular verse. Number one, we see that it is all of everything, of all of our increase. And again, like I said, I believe that this is because God is the one that's blessing us. God's the one that blessed the land. He told them repeatedly that He was the one that blessed the land. He was the one that would cause the land to flourish. He was the one that would cause the land to bring forth fruit. And then He makes the statement there that, but uh, I'm sorry, in verse number 30, He says, is the Lord's, referring to the tithe. He repeats it and says, it is holy unto the Lord. Now, <coughs> I want you to notice that God says here, He gives a principle here. And this, is, this ties in with and teaches us why the tithe transcends the Old Covenant. And this is why the tithe was instituted inside of or within the Old Covenant or the Old Testament in the first place. The Bible refers to the tithe as the Lord's over and over again. The 10th percent of what we have, God just claims that for himself. Any of our increase, God himself just says, hey, that's mine. Anything that we, you know, are, are any area that we are increased in, whether we be a farmer and let's say that we bring in, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit of crops one year. We have a lot of, you know, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, seeds that bring forth great fruit. You know, uh, let's say we have a bunch of animals and of those animals we have quite a bit that we bring in. A tenth part of that God claims for himself. A tenth of what we have, of what we possess, of our increase, that is the Lord's. It is the Lord's, it tells us. Read one more time, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. So what's being explained is... One-tenth of our increase, one-tenth of all things, the Bible says, is the Lord's. So the reason why they gave the tithe, the reason why God said to give the tithe in the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament is because He claims that for Himself. It's set apart. Notice it says, it is holy unto the Lord. That means that it's set apart for the Lord. It is sanctified for the Lord. So the reason why we tithe, the reason why we give a 10% is because it is the Lord's. Why did God command them to tithe in the Old Covenant to begin with? Because it is the Lord's. Now, this is a principle, like I said, it goes all the way back to the beginning of time even. That's why they were tithing prior to the Old Covenant. That's why you, it would make perfect sense that we would see them doing so. We see Abraham giving a tenth of all. Why? Because he knew a tenth of what I have is the Lord's. Where does, where does this come from? Where does this idea originate. We saw Jacob doing it as well. This is obviously a practice that was continual within God's people. Well, the very first time that you see this taking place is in Genesis, and it takes place with Cain and Abel. Now, when it takes place with Cain and Abel, the word that it, use, <coughs> that it uses is firstlings. And if you're not familiar with what firstlings is referring to, and again, I'm going to tie this in much later and make this much uh, clearer for you, firstlings is a, a way to refer to the tithe. Now, specifically, firstlings refers to the tenth of the flock. Firstlings is referring to a flock. It's referring to sheep. It's referring to goats or oxen. The tenth of that flock or the tenth of that, ca that group of cattle would be the firstlings. And what we see in Genesis, uh, what Abel brings is he brings the firstlings of the flock. They're used interchangeable. I'll give you a couple examples. We read from Deuteronomy chapter 14 before. I think it was verse 22. Here's Deuteronomy 14, 23. It says, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn and of thy wine, of thine oil. And then he says this, And the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks. So he, first, he uses the word tithe when he's just talking about the increase of their, their oil and the corn and the wine and all of those things. But then when he wants to talk about the, the tithe of their flock, he says, The firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, he says, That thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So firstlings is another way to just refer to the tithe, but it's when they're talking about the oxen. It's when they're talking about cattle and herds. Second Chronicles 31.5 teaches this as well. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field. Notice it's of all their increase. 
And then it says, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. So there it says first fruits. Tithe is a general word that means tenth. But also the word firstlings and first fruits refers to the tithe. The first fruits would refer to things that would be plants or grain when it's talking about the tithe. That is the first fruits. That is the tithe of their fruit. And you would just refer to it as the first fruit. Then we have the first lings. That is the tithe of the herds and the tithe of the cattle. So tithe is more of the general word, the tenth of all your increase. And then the first lings is specifically the tithe of your cattle and of your herds. And the first fruits is specifically the tithe of the corn, wine, oil, things that grow as far as agriculture when we're speaking of that aspect of your harvest. So when we see Abel bringing the firstlings of his flock, do you know what he's doing? He's tithing. He didn't come up with this on his own. Obviously God commanded this to him and this was passed down through the, uh, uh, through the line of <coughs> God's people. You know, he didn't just come up with all, oh, I'm just going to give the tenth part. And then just, just so happens to be the exact commandment that's given later. You can prove this many ways. Number one, Cain sinned. How can, you know, how would, would Cain not bringing the appropriate offering, how could that be a sin? It just shows that they were commanded to do so, number one. Number two, it, it praises Abel's faith when he brought his offering in Hebrews chapter number 11. Well, the Bible says that our faith has to be founded in God's word. It tells us in, in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 17, it says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's very obvious and very clear that all the way back to Cain and Abel, the, the second generation of mankind, God said, bring me your tithe. Bring the 10%. Why? Because it's His. That's why. Before the Old Covenant was ever given, before the Old Testament was ever given on Mount Sinai, He said, bring me your tithe. Proving that it transcends the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. It was implemented into, and, 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 and it, was, it was a component within the Old Testament because it is the Lord's. That's why. That's the reason why. <coughs> so we are to tithe on all our increase. The word tithe means tenth. Um, uh, the firstlings is the tithe. The first fruits is the tithe, but it just refers to a specific aspect of the tithe. Now, why is it a percentage? I want to show you how calculated and how wise God is. Why is it a percentage? Let me explain it to you this way. <coughs> uh, when we look at the Old Testament tribes, right? The tribes in, within the Old Testament uh, 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 passages, we read about the 12 tribes, right? When you look at it, <coughs> there are 12 tribes as far as the 12 sons of Israel. That's not how they were broken down when they inherited their land. It was much different than that. Because the Levites, <coughs> excuse me, the Levites did not inherit land because, you know, basically God inherited the Levites. The, you know, the, the, God took the Levites of man. I want you to notice how, how God even needs a tenth of everything, even of mankind. He's like, they're mine. You know why? Because that's his tithe of mankind. Of all the fruit of all the earth that it brings forth, a tenth of it is his. So that's a point to, to go ahead and you know, put in the back of our brains and think about. So he takes that, the tithe of all of mankind. Then on top of that, uh, we know that he gives the land, he splits up the land a little bit differently because uh, the two sons of Joseph inherit their own property. And then that is the 11, right? So there's 11, specifically there are 11 different, thank you. There's 11 different, uh, well maybe I'll drink the other one. I actually only have like a sip left in the other one so that does work out. So there's 11 tribes now that have inherited. Now this is very calculated. 11 tribes. Um, of those 11, <coughs> Their tithe had a dual purpose. It was given to the Lord. It was given to God because it was God's. But God used it to feed the ministers. Now the reason why He used it to feed the ministers is because He wanted them to serve continually. That's why He took a tenth, which was one full tribe. He said, I'm going to take one full tribe and I want them, why? To serve continually. Well, they have to eat. They have to have, you know, uh, uh, food, they have to have drink, they have to have all of these types of things in order to survive. So the way that he, he worked this out was, hey, my tithe that is going to be given to me, it's taken to my house so that I can have it. Well, the Levites will be at my house and you'll just take the tenth there. And when the sacrifice is offered, they'll take part in the sacrifice and eat of the sacrifice and that can be their sustenance as well. So notice how this is very calculated. It works out very well. The ministers can now work full time. God receives the tenth. It's still taken to God's house. So all of this makes perfect sense. But not only that, think about this with the percentage. 
If you have 11 tribes, if you take one-tenth of the 11 tribes, one-tenth of their sustenance, and, 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 and then give that to an entire tribe, well, that, make, that would calculate out almost perfectly to feed them throughout the entire year. It would calculate perfectly to feed each person all the way throughout the entire year. So it makes perfect sense that if you were to take one-tenth of each of the tribes, because all of the tribes are supposed to give, then that would be enough, enough for one entire tribe. And not only that, it actually comes out to one-tenth as opposed to eleven. And do you know why? Because when the Levites received theirs, they had to tithe on a tenth of theirs. So there, one tithe goes out the window. So it comes out exactly to one-tenth. So you see how this is extremely calculated and you see God's wisdom when you actually, when you focus in on how this worked out perfectly and it's the exact amount that they needed. And it's taken to God's house and God still receives it. So it has multiple purposes. And then plus we have the spiritual aspect of the tithe and this would be with the lamb, the sacrifice that's given, where we can see the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see layers upon layers of the tithe and the uses for it and all of these different types of things. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 9 and 10. It's perfect that it's a percentage. It has to be a percentage. And that is, let's say, uh, uh, <coughs> if you know the percentage of the Israelites, a plague goes through the land and many people die out. Right? Well, you know, Levites are going to die. You know, the, those in the tribe of Judah are going to die. Those in Dan are going to die. Well, it's still a percentage. So that means that the smaller they get, it still works out perfectly. It's not just this set amount of, hey, bring this amount of, you know, your harvest every year, whatever that may be. What if they make less? What if they have less? So the percentage is very calculated. It's perfect. Look at it in a New Testament local church. The less people there are... <coughs> the smaller needs there are going to be. So if each person tithes, then we're still going to have enough for that. Let's say the, the larger the church gets, well, the larger the needs are going to be. And if each person tithes, we're still going to have enough for that. It's the same concept. It's very calculated, and you can see God's wisdom. People don't look at the Bible, and they're like, oh, man, it, you know, the Bible's you know, you know, so foolish. The Bible is a very, very wise book. It's very thought out. It's very calculated because it comes from the mind of the Lord. It's the perfect implementation when it comes to a system like this. It's absolutely perfect. It fulfills multiple uh, uh, um, um, purposes just in one t uh, type of giving or one type of system that's given. I want to further prove to you, <coughs> excuse me, that the tithe transcends the old covenant. The book of Proverbs is a, a book of wisdom and it's timeless. We all know that. I've heard that so many times. Just universal truths are found in the book of Proverbs. And I want you to notice here in Proverbs chapter number <coughs> 3, <coughs> I want you to notice what it says in verse number 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance. And then it says, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So notice what we're doing when, <coughs> when we tithe. Remember, first fruits, it says, of all thine increase. You gotta give of, you're supposed to give of all your increase. God commands us to do so. And he says, the first fruits of all thine increase. <coughs> But it says that we are honoring the Lord. When we tithe, when we give a tenth percent of what we have, we are giving honor unto God. We are honoring the Lord with that uh, uh, offering that we give to the Lord. <coughs> I want you to now go to Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. And I'm sorry... <coughs> You don't have to. I'll, I'll just read it to you. I wanted you to keep your hand there in Proverbs 3, but it's okay. I'll just read to you in just a moment. Malachi chapter number 3. Now, know, knowing and understanding that the tithe is God's and was God's before the Old Covenant, and that he says that it is, it is mine is the reason why you should give the tenth, and that's the reason why it was implemented in the law in the first place, it would make perfect sense that if it is his and it is not yours, if one-tenth of, of what you make is already God's possession, let me ask you what what would you be doing if when you got your increase, if you just spent all of it and you didn't take it and give it to the Lord? What would you be doing if that is God's and you used it? Let's say that, that I somehow got possession of you know, one-tenth of Brother Hall's finances or one-tenth of Brother Rick's finances and I went and I spent it. What would you say that I did? 
I stole it from them. You'd say that I stole it or I, or I robbed them would be another way that you could word that, right? Well, it would make perfect sense that if it is just intrinsically God's, like just, just it, oh, it is God's and God's pos God possesses it. He set apart the tenth of everything, of, even, you know, of all things. He set that apart of the increase and says, that's mine. If you don't give it unto him, God considers that stealing from him. Wouldn't that make perfect sense? If it's, and this would, the only way for this to be true is you just have to transcend the Old Testament covenant, right. which we see all the way back beforehand. Notice what God says in Malachi chapter number 3. Look at verse number 8. <coughs> it says, Will a man rob God? <coughs> Saying, Would you rob me? I mean, the reason why I ask that question, it's like, man, that's pretty serious. Can you imagine somebody like, let's say God, somebody was able to get access to God's house. Can you imagine someone breaking into God's house and stealing from him? Sounds like a pretty big deal, right? Look at verse 9. Or 8, I'm sorry. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? Watch this. In tithes and offerings. And then he goes on and explains, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now where does he explain when he, they robbed him? He says, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. The tithes were offerings. That's why he words it that way. Why would he consider it robbery. If we just stop and think about this, it makes perfect sense. What did he tell us in Leviticus chapter number 27? The reason why they were to bring their tithes. What was it? It was because it was his. He said, that is mine. It is holy unto the Lord. The tenth part of everything that you have, I possess it. So if you were to go and if you were to not give that to him, right? He allowed, he entrusted you with it. He brought forth this great increase and this great blessing. But he said, hey, a tenth of that is mine. Make sure that you bring it to my house and give it to me. If it's not put into his house... You were entrusted with it, but it wasn't yours. If it's not put into his house, what did you do to God? If you sat at your house and consumed it, or if you decided to give it to somebody else or to do something else with it, what did you do to the Lord? You robbed God. That's like stealing from God. This is a, a, a truth that's taught in the book of, Le uh, I'm sorry, in uh, the law, the Old Testament law, that it is Lord, is the Lord's, but it's also very clearly taught here. The only way that that can be true is if this was intrinsically His. It makes perfect sense. And a lot of, I want you to notice what it also goes on to say. Look at verse number 10. He says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And then he says, And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now I want you to notice that God talks about that if you were to tithe, if you were to tithe, that God <coughs> promises that He is going to bless you. Now, the way that people will preach this falsely is that they, they preach that, hey, if you tithe, God's going to you know, give you back money and you're going to become very rich. Well, the Bible never promises that God is just going to bless you with massive riches if you give. The Bible is very clear that sometimes when you give and when you tithe, that when God blesses you, it may not be a physical blessing. It might be a spiritual blessing, which is better anyways. And that's hard for people to understand. If I could choose to be blessed by God in a certain way because I've tithed, I would, I would choose 100% every time to be blessed in a spiritual way. I would rather God bless me spiritually. If, you, if God said, hey, which blessing would you take, spiritual or physically, because you've been tithing, I would say spiritual every single time. The physical only lasts for a short period of time. And it's very easy to be hung up in physical things and finances and stuff like that because you do need it to survive. And also because we live in the United States of America and we have a certain uh, 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 level of comfort that we're used to. You can get hung up in these types of things. Even me, everybody can. But we need to keep our eyes on the prize and understand that the things of, of this world are corruptible. And we need to be, we should, you know, care more about things that are uncorruptible. And we should choose the spiritual blessing. So just because you tithe, that doesn't mean God, you, you put a tenth in, that doesn't mean God's going to give you, you know, uh, uh, let's say you, you tithe the hundred bucks. That doesn't mean God's going to give you a thousand dollars. That's not how that works. But I will promise you this, that God will, will take care of you every single time financially. He'll make sure financially that you you do have enough, and I can, I can tell you this, and I've heard other people say this, and I'm not repeating them, I can promise you from, you know, uh, 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 promise you, it, the, the strongest promise ever 
that myself personally, every time that I am very strict about tithing, extremely strict in my life about tithing, I, those are the times in my life when I do the best financially. Every time. I promise you that. I've noticed that when I am very, very strict about tithing, when I make sure I never miss tithing, I make sure that I'm, you know, because there's been times in your life where you, 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 know, you miss a few times or whatever it may be, but when I've tithed in my life, I'm, I'm telling you every single time. Those are the times that I do the best financially. It's not that I'm just blowing up financially or something like that, but I always it's always easier to pay my bills and things like that when I tithe. And I believe that that is a blessing from God. I didn't become a millionaire, but God took care of me and that's all that I need. I didn't stress and worry about my finances and worry about my money. And notice what God says in verse 10. In verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouses that there may be meat in mine house. And then he says this, <coughs> and prove me now herewith. He's saying, test me and prove me. What's the reason why he'd have to say that? What's the reason why he would say, hey, give me a tenth. And then he says this, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. So notice he's saying, if you tithe, I'll make sure to take care of you. Because they would be worried about giving the tenth unto him. It's the same today. People are always concerned oftentimes about tithing or giving the tenth because they feel like they can't afford to give the tenth. Again, that's why it's a percentage. Because if you make more, it's going to be a, a, a larger amount. If you make less, it's going to be a less amount. So it, that's one of the reasons why it's a percentage. So God's not gouging you. But also, even on top of that, we have the spiritual promise that if we tithe, God says, I'll take care of you. And he says, prove me. If you don't believe it, if you're nervous, if you're scared, if you feel like you can't afford it, he said, prove me and find out if I'll do it. We see this also taught in Proverbs chapter number 3. It said in verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. <coughs> so notice that he says, I'm going to bless you if you, tithe, if you tithe to me. If you tithe, you're going to receive blessings. I'm going to make sure that I take care of you. If we tithe on all of our increase, God will take care of us. He promises us and he says, Prove me to see if that's so. Prove me to see if that's so. Oftentimes we lean upon our own understanding and we feel as if we look at our finances, we look at, a, look at our, our, our uh, uh, you know, accounting book and we say, I just can't afford to give, afford to give 10%. When God said, hey, give me 10% and prove me. Well, that's why I believe in Proverbs 3, verse 5, we have this verse. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Notice that it takes faith. You have to trust God. And what did God mean when he said, prove me? What is he saying that you have to do? Put your faith in me and test me to see if I'll do what I said I'll do. So it takes faith to tithe. It does take faith. You have to trust God that He is going to do what He said He's going to do. That you're not going to be you know, left out on the street. That, that God is going to actually bless you. So we learn a lot of things from that. We learn that if you don't give the tithe, that God considers that robbing Him and that is because it is His. It's very interesting also. It doesn't come right out and say this clearly, but when the children of Israel came into the land of Canaan, the promised land, there were ten battles they, that they fought, ten cities that they destroyed, and the very first one <coughs> was Jericho. Do you remember God's commandment? He said, nobody touch anything. He doesn't tell you why. But he says, nobody touch anyways. He says it's sanctified unto the Lord. He never uses the word tithe. He doesn't use that at all. But notice that there was ten cities. But at the very first one, he said, that's mine. Why? Intrinsically, God owns everything. At least, and he know what he chooses to, to take? One-tenth of it all. Everything's God's. The whole world is God. But God chose himself to say, I get one-tenth of everything. That's why he took the Levites, one-tenth. That's why he, he, he told them, hey, I want a tenth of the increase. It is God's. That's why if you don't give it to him, you're robbing. Do you remember the man Achan? Do you remember what happened? Achan. Achan took of that. And do you know what it says that he did? He stole. All those people were dead. Nobody was alive. They went in and they took the spoils of all the other cities. Think about that. And God never said you stole. God never said you robbed those people. All of Jericho was dead. And Achan looked down and he took a Babylonian-ish garment. And he took, a, I believe, a, a, a silver, right? Or gold, one of the two. And he hid it in his tent. And of course they stoned him because of that. Do you remember what they said that he did? He said that he robbed, that he stole. It actually tells them, or says that Achan, the way it describes it, is that he stole it. Who did he steal it from? 
The Lord is who he stole it from because the tenth is God's. That's why. The tenth of all things he intrinsically owns. That is God's. What does that have to do with the Old Testament covenant? What did the firstlings that Abel brought have to do with the, the, the Old Testament covenant? Why did, why did Abraham give a tenth to Melchizedek? What does that have to do with the Old Testament law? Because it's God's. That's why. He chose, this is mine. The tenth is the Lord's. One tenth is mine. This, is, this transcends the Old Testament law and it was only put into the Old Testament law because it is the Lord's. And, he, and, and because God is so wise, He was able to use it for... It had a multi-purpose and served multiple purposes. I want you to go with me now to Nehemiah chapter number 10. One of the purposes, <coughs> as I said, <coughs> is to feed the ministers. It is to sustain the ministers. He uses the tithe to sustain the ministers. I want to spend some time on this. This is very interesting. Nehemiah chapter number 10. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Nehemiah chapter number 10 and God wanted the, uh, the Levites to serve continually. He says that and uses that exact phrase that they may serve continually in the tabernacle. <coughs> and I want you to notice what takes place here when people weren't tithing. Look at uh, Nehemiah <coughs> chapter number 10 look at verse number 36. It says, also the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, notice that, firstborn, and the firstlings of our herds and of our flocks to bring to the house of our God unto the priests that minister in the house of our God. And notice how they were using that. It was, bring, it was to be brought unto the, the priest. <clears throat> and that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the, and the fruit of all manner of trees, of wine and oil unto the priest to the chambers of the house of our God. And it says, And the tithes of, the ground, of our ground unto the Levites, that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. Notice it's being used to feed the ministers, that that's also another purpose of it, right? Uh, it's interesting that the very first time that we see Abraham there tithing, that he gives... <coughs> to a minister, but he's also giving it to God. So one of the purposes is to give it to God. One of the purposes is to give it to the minister. Not only that, where did... <coughs> what did um, Jacob refer to that stone or that pillar when he said, I'm going to give this tithe here? He said, God's house. Where did they say that they were bringing it here? Look at verse number 36. To the, under the priest that minister, at the very end there, under the priest that minister in the house of our God. Notice they're bringing it to the priest, they're bringing it to God because it's the tenth and, and that is his. And they're also bringing it to the house of God. This is a, there's vast consistency here. Look at verse 38. <clears throat> and the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes unto the house of our God to the chambers into the treasure house. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, of the new wine, and the oil unto the chambers. Where, where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the porters and the singers? And we will not forsake the house of our God. I want you to go over to Nehemiah chapter number 12. So notice that <coughs> he's instituting now that they are going to begin bringing the tithe again. This is because God's house was forsaken prior to this. Now a good way to make sure that you keep coming to church is you, know, you take the, the, uh, uh, the command of tithing seriously. And you always bring your tithe to God's house. Every year, they brought their tithe to the Lord's house. And because they had to bring their tithe, I'm sure that caused people to go to church. If you take the command very seriously about tithing, then you know what you'll do? You'll make sure you bring your tithe. And you know what else you'll do? You'll make sure you come to God's house. What's God's house in the New Testament? What's the church, we're told? Now, we'll get to that in a minute. It's a good way to make sure that you come to God's house. And that God's house is not forsaken. Look at chapter number 12. <clears throat> Look at verse number 43. It says, Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children re rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. Notice they're all happy. And, and verse 44, And at that time were some appointed over the chambers for the treasures, for the offerings, for the first fruits, and for the tithes to gather into them out of the fields of the cities the portions of the law for the priests and Levites... <clears throat> 
for Judah rejoiced for the priests and for the Levites that waited. Now notice they're bringing in the tithes and the offerings. There are ministers that are appointed. And notice that the, 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 uh, the land of Judah was happy that the Levites were appointed. You may have read over that, but that's what that's saying. It's, they're saying that they're happy to bring their tithe. They're happy to be able to support them so that the Levites could be there serving full time. That is what it's teaching. It's saying that they were happy to bring their tithe and they were happy for the Levites that waited, waited on their ministry. It's saying that they were working in this ministry and that they were appointed to this task. Look at verse 45. And both the singers and the porters kept the ward of their God and the ward of the purification according to the commandment of David and of Solomon his son. <clears throat> For in the days of David and Asaph, uh, verse 43 or 47, skip down. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah gave the portions of the singers and the porters. You know what that's saying? That they gave the portions that those people needed to continue working full time in the ministry. God's, God's will is, for t is to have full time ministers in the ministry. It goes on to say this. And they sanctified holy things unto the Levites, and the Levites sanctified them unto the children of Aaron. Go over to Nehemiah chapter number 13, verse number 7. <clears throat> This is Nehemiah when he shows up after they instituted all the Levites and appointed them to their tasks and to their jobs like we just saw. Because remember, the, the temple was forsaken because it had been destroyed. They just rebuilt the temple and now they're, they're setting in and into their positions and into their, uh, uh, their offices. Ministers, Levites, singers, porters, all these positions. So now they're back and they're rolling. Right? The, the house of the Lord is not forsaken anymore and they have officers and ministers waiting on their office. But look at verse 7. Watch what happens. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. Now do you remember what was supposed to go into those chambers? and What they were supposed to bring in? What happens here is this man comes in and he runs off all of the, the Levites. Look at what it says in verse 8. And it grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded and they cleansed the chambers and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. So they took and they, to they tossed out all the tithe and all the things that they had brought in there. And they, they brought Eliashib into his spot and he put his household stuff. So he got rid of all the, the stuff for the Levites. That was their tithe that they had just brought in. Because remember, they, one of the jobs that they just gave was for them to carry in all the tithe of all the people that was going to support them and, you know, and so that they were able to eat it of the year. <clears throat> then when Elisha came in, they got rid of it. And now Nehemiah's coming back and he kicked Elisha out and all the household stuff and he moved all the chambers of the vessels with the meat offerings and all those things back in. And then look at verse 10. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. So notice that they had stopped giving all of the foods and the tithes to them because when Elisha came in, he put a stop to it. Now, what did, what did that cause the Levites to have to do? Exactly. The Levites had to flee back to their, to their field because they weren't receiving sustenance. They didn't have anything to allow them to be able to stay there and work continually and minister continually unto God's house. Look at uh, verse number 11. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Notice what that causes here. It causes again, we see, the house of God forsaken. We saw that same phrase used before. Uh, and I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. And I made treasurers over the treasuries, Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites, Padiah. And next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah. For they were counted faithful and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. So he assigns a person uh, the task to distribute all of the new tithes that have been given to all of the Levites so that they could partake in those particular things. <clears throat> also, I want you to go to, um, oh, we read all the way down to verse 12. Okay, uh, I want you to turn now to the New Testament. I want you to go to the New Testament. I want to uh, compare a couple of things to the New Testament. It's very interesting. Go to Acts chapter number 6. So we saw there 
multiple purposes of the tithe. And one of them was to feed the ministers so the ministers were able to work full time in the ministry. Now people that attack the tithe, it's always, it's most of the time, let me say this, because there are some honest people I believe, there are some people that <coughs> are just wrong about this issue and are misguided about this issue and, and you know, in a sincere heart. You know, obviously everyone is not, does not have bad intentions. Some people just come to the wrong conclusions for whatever reason. But I'll tell you that the majority of those that attack the tithe fall into a particular category. The house church type of people. The people that don't attend church. Not everyone. So if that's not you, then don't take offense to this. But the people that don't attend church. People that attack the church. Not only that, they, they almost always attack there being a pastor that works full time and a pastor that's being paid. It, obviously, today we have pastors in God's house that are the New Testament ministers. Why would It would make perfect sense why they would attack the tithe, why they would attack these things, because the tithe, by God's command, was given to provide for the ministers. So that makes perfect sense why they would attack hand in hand. Not only that, they attack the church. They attack God's house, where, the place wherein, wherein you know, God's people meet, when people, when they come together. I want you to go to, as I said, Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6. We saw in the Old Testament there that God desired for them to be there full time. He desired them to wait continually. And He took of the Levites <coughs> so that they could be there continually. And He set this system up so that they could be there continually. In the New Testament, there is no difference. Jesus, when He began His ministry, He worked full time in the ministry. Jesus was not, during those three years, it never mentions Jesus working as a carpenter. When they talk about Jesus being a carpenter, that's what just people knew because he grew up being a carpenter and his father was also a carpenter. But during those three years, Jesus is never mentioned doing any kind of secular work at all. On the contrary, he's traveling throughout all of Israel the entire time. He's traveling through Israel to the point he's, he has groups of people following him around. They're not following him to his secular job throughout the day. The, the clear picture that's being painted is that when Jesus began his ministry, he started going around full time in his ministry. And it tells you that from that day forward he began to preach. That means he began his ministry and he was working full time in his ministry at that time. There, there's a time in which where Jesus takes and he appoints his disciples as well. And you know what he does is he appoints them, and I'm going to show this to you in just a minute. He appoints them full time in the ministry. Luke chapter number 10 verse number 1 says this, After these things the Lord appointed other 70 also. So these are the 70 that were after the 12. Uh, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would go. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house, and if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. This says in verse 7, And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such thing as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house, and into whatsoever city ye enter, and they, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. So notice they're not providing for themselves. God plans on providing for them, so they're Working full time is the point. And he, and he quotes a specific passage. This is from the Old Testament. And he makes the, the statement, For the laborer is worthy of his hire. So God desires for ministers to work full time and to be paid for the work that they do. Uh, this is the apostles being, not the twelve, the seventy, but the twelve were already doing what the seventy here were appointed to do. Uh, in Acts chapter number 6, we see that the apostles were working full time in the ministry. Just like Jesus did, just like the 70 did. So they continued doing this. Look at Acts chapter number 6, verse number 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministry. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. <laughs> 
So notice they're saying it's not, it, it wouldn't make sense is what they mean by reason. It's not reasonable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. So notice he's saying and go back to like a, a, a more of what would be a secular type of task that we need to spend our time studying the Word of God. These are referring to, these would be pastors in this position. They're apostles, but they did the job, and I've showed that, of a bishopric, which is like a pastor. Look at verse 4. But we will give ourselves, watch this, continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So what are they doing all the time? They are giving themselves continually to the Word of God, to prayer, and to the ministry of the Word. So notice what they're spending time on, the Word of God. That's preaching. We see them preaching, of course. They're preaching the Word of God, studying the Word of God, and also praying. So their job full-time, and it says continually. That's the same language it uses about the Levites of the Old Testament. So it says continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Then they give, <coughs> they, they assign... Uh, uh, seven men that are going to be the deacons. That is their job to continually do that. Right? They are going to be full time in this ministry of, of, of you know, serving tables, of doing the menial tasks and things that are normally outside of you know, the Bible and prayer. They preach also, but the majority of what they do is to be the menial physical tasks. Now that is very interesting that we can see very clearly they're working full time. They're, you know, uh, uh, they're, 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 they are uh, continually giving themselves to the word of God and prayer. We see deacons being able to do that. We see the Levites doing it in the Old Testament and that God desired for them to, to be serving in the house of God all the time. Once you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, I want to touch on this a little bit further. Because like I said, people will hand in hand, they'll attack these two doctrines because the tithe was meant to support the ministers. We see the, who are the ministers in the New Testament? It was meant to support the ministers of the Old Testament. Who are the ministers in the New Testament? It would be those that preached the gospel. It would have been the apostles. It would have been those that were the, the, the deacons right there. They, were, they ended up being supported by it. They, uh, we would have seen the, uh, uh, the 12 apostles, the 70, right? Uh, right here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, it talks about ministers or pastors being paid. Now, I want to also give you something very interesting. Listen to this principle. This is extremely interesting. Romans chapter number 13, verse number 6 says this. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. So he's saying because, you know, they, uh, people were working in the government and they're doing the work of the Lord is what it actually describes. Pay ye tribute also. Watch this. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Notice the same word that's used. Continually. So why does God approve of a tax? Why does God approve of paying taxes? Because they would be considered, by extension, God's ministers, right? That's how he justifies that, hey, it, it would be right to pay them because we, God believes in having punishers of evildoers. And because they do what? They attend continually to this. What does that mean? That's their full-time job. So those that work full-time or continually, just like the Levites did, and exactly the same word that was used when the apostles talked about what they did, it says it makes sense to pay tribute, right? Or you should pay tribute. So the Bible teaches this principle that God approves of ministers being paid, and he allotted the, the, the tithe for this very clearly, and it was to be brought to the ministers, it was to be, to be brought to the ministers, in or at God's house. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number uh, 1. We'll just begin there. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are ye not are, are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle, apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. <coughs> Excuse me. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife? He's saying, don't I have the right to eat and drink? Don't I have the right to lead about, to have, a, to have a wife if I wanted to? As well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. So he, he points out that the brethren of the Lord, they have wives. Cephas, that's Peter, they have a wife. He's saying, I could if I wanted to myself. And he was also tying that in with, have we not power to eat and drink? Saying, you know, 
uh, to be supported here. I won't get into that. To, to, to be supported and being paid for the work that he does. Look at verse 9. Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? He's saying, don't I have the ability or the right to, to, to stop working a secular job? He was a tent maker and he continued to be so. But he's saying he had the right by God to forsake that job, to stop working or forbear working his secular job and just be paid or supported by those that uh, were at the local churches. He, he goes on to say in verse 7, Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. The reason why he says say I these things as a man, because anytime anybody talks about this subject, and they're the minister, he's the minister, what would somebody say to that person? Oh, that's just because you want the money. You, because you're a minister, that's why you're saying that. That's why you want the money. That's what Paul is saying that. Am I just saying this as a man? Or does the Bible or does the law say this also? Doesn't God teach this exact principle? Because he's trying to teach them, hey, I can stop working and, and be supported and take in the money, right, that, that the church takes in. Look at verse number uh, 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 9. <coughs> For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox of uh, the, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. Saying God doesn't care about the oxen, he said that so that we can learn from the principle, right? Um, and then he goes on and says this. <clears throat> That he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. He says this in verse 11, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is, a, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He's saying the spiritual things are more important. And I've sowed to you spiritual things. Would it be a big deal if I reaped, if I decided to reap your carnal things? Of course, he has a specific job where he's traveling throughout everywhere. And he's just riding to the church at Corinth. Look at verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you... So he's saying there's others that are taking advantage of them at Corinth, but for whatever reason, people, it seems like, are complaining that, that, uh, about Paul trying to do this when Paul doesn't even do it. He says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now that's Paul's decision, but he's saying, I have the right, and I have the power to do it. Now, uh, so this passage is just, couldn't be any clearer that it's, it's teaching that ministers should be paid. Ministers should be paid for what they do. They have power to eat and drink. They have the right to eat and drink. And if they're going to continually you know, work and do things like that, you sh it's, it's ridiculous to say that all oh, they shouldn't you know, uh, uh, be paid for this. God's desire and God's will is for them to continually do that. Jesus sent out the ministers full time. Sent out the apostles to do this full time. The Old Testament, the Levites... He wanted them working full time. And that's the whole reason why the tithe was implemented in the first place. Look at verse 13. Notice what it says now. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the holy things of the temple? So what are the holy things that he's talking about? It was the tithes that they had brought in. The holy things of the temple, the sacrifices, the offerings, right? They that minister about holy things live of the holy things of the temple. It was the tithe. That's specifically what he's talking about. Those that were ministering at the temple, they were living off of the holy things, of the money that was brought in, or the uh, uh, whether it be money or whether it be the increase of their field specifically. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. So the things that they spend their time working on all day, that is how they are fed. It's like the minister feeding you and then being fed from you. It's like the priest serving for all of Israel and then being fed from all of Israel. It'd be like a pastor, that's what he's saying, serving at the church, so he's paid by the church. Then what it says in verse 14, Even so, so in the same way, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now notice he says, Even so hath the Lord ordained. Now what is another word for the word ordained? Commanded? Or appointed. People talk about people being ordained or he appointed. Now what did, the, what did it say in Luke 10.1? After these things the Lord appointed 70 others. And what did he tell them? Don't take anything. They're going to feed you. Those people are going to pay you for the work that you do. And he makes the statement 
For the laborer is worthy of his hire. When it says the Lord, it's talking about Jesus specifically. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Furthermore, the point to prove that is that Paul just quoted that here as well. He, he quote, Paul uses that and teaches that for the laborer is worthy of his hire. And he quotes it in verse number, what is it, 10. Then after he gets done teaching it himself, he says, even so hath the Lord ordained. Because he's referencing back. Isn't that interesting that Paul knew about the scripture there? He's referencing back. Of course he does the Holy Spirit, but also I believe he had ha access to that because God used this man. So Paul knew about that and that God had done that and Jesus had done that. He's saying that's what God ordained. And notice that it aligns the two, the priests and how they were supported in the Old Testament and they ministered at the Old Testament. But now there's been a change and there's the New Testament. That was God's house in the Old Testament and there was purposes for the tithe. Number one, it's the Lord's. It's a principle that transcends. It is, goes beyond the Old Covenant. It is because it is His and He has commanded that a tenth of that is always mine. That's why we see people long before the Old Covenant in Mount Sinai giving a tenth. The very beginning God said, hey Abel, bring me a tenth because it's mine. Abraham gives a tenth. Isaac, Jacob gives a tenth. Right? We see they bring the tenth where? To God's house. Where did uh, um, Jacob say that he was going to give the tenth of all. And what did he call that place? God's house. That's what he called that place, right? Another purpose of it was to feed the ministers. Well, the transition takes place and it doesn't take a lot of common sense. The, the tenth is still the Lord's. Nothing changed. It's still God's. And you know where you take it? God's house. And you know what it's for? The ministers, just like it's being taught here very plainly. Where is God's house now in the New Testament? Well, 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 15 tells us, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. It's also interesting that he sets up that pillar and says, Hey, this is God's house. It was to represent the Lord's house, which is God's people, the church of the living God. That's where it's taken. And that's the same place to be technical where it was taken in the Old Testament because that's the congregation, that's the church. The ministers have just changed. And it's still the Lord's and this transcends the law. It was given to, in the law because it was already God's. And what's the purpose? For the ministers. In 1 Corinthians 9, he parallels the two. And he says that's how they were supported by the tithe. That's how they're going to be supported today. It's as clear as day. It makes perfect sense. This is also in 1 Timothy 5, 17. It says, <coughs> excuse me, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. This is a very clear teaching. It's, it's extremely obvious. A lot of people will, you will try to, would try to attack me, I'm sure, saying that you're just a money grabber and you're just wanting to, you know, get money from the church. I have a secular job, buddy. I could pull the card that Paul pulled. I don't, I don't get paid from Valiant Baptist Church at all. Period. None. None. Nothing. I make zilch from Valiant Baptist Church. I tithe from my secular job just like you do. I'm not being a hypocrite. And this is actually biblical. I thought that I, that I actually had this. I, I could have swore that I copied and pasted this. But ministers are, in the Old Testament, they were to tithe as well. And this is where I get this teaching from. It was in the book of Numbers, and I could have swore. Uh, maybe I missed one of those pages. But in the book of Numbers, the commandment is given for the Levites to tithe as well. They are to tithe as well. They are to give a tenth of what is brought. And I'm a minister of the New Covenant, so even, even when I worked full-time in the ministry, when I worked full-time at the church in Arizona, please, you know, it's, it's not to be named among any of us, but uh, I actually tithed as well. I tithe. I had, and, and, and this will tie in with something in just a moment, uh, but I had a system set up where, you know, you can get into Excel spreadsheets, and uh, uh, it's not Excel because it's for Mac, but it's numbers in Mac, but you can set up formulas. So I had multiple formulas, and I did the payroll as well. And my very first formula that I had coming out of my check was what? What do you think it was? The very first one. The tithe. I made sure it was my first formula. 
that I put there. One, the first one, because it's the firstlings. Uh, it's the first of your increase. So anything that I had that came out of my check, that was the first. That was the very first one. I made sure that that came out first. So I tithed as well, even off of that. And I believe that... <coughs> That if we study the Bible, we need to come away with biblical principles and we need to understand the spirit of a commandment as well and study it and, and walk away with the what is the Bible teaching. Those are the Old Testament ministers. That's how they were supported. That's how the New Testament ministers are to, are to be supported by the tithe because it's the Lord. It's brought to God's house. It's very clear. And New Testament ministers should tithe as well. That's your increase. If that's your increase, I think I can prove this from multiple uh, uh, ways. And that was the increase of the Levites, and they tithed also. So if anybody's working full-time for a ministry, they need to be tithing as well. The other guys did not, and I never brought that up to them because I didn't believe it was my place. But ministers that work for the Lord in His ministry, they need to be tithing. They should be tithing. That's your increase. That's God's. That's how it works. It's because it's the Lord's, it's His. And even if you're working for the church, and you're like, you're like a Levite not giving your tithe. That's what you're doing. You're, you have the tenth of your increase. doesn't matter where you got it. And then you're not giving that. You're eating it and you're now robbing God. That's what that is. That's what's going on there. And it's not right if pastors are doing that. So pastors need to be aware of that. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 14. This is one of the... Uh, and I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on this. We were here earlier and I mentioned we were going to go back. People will talk about, you know... <coughs> well, you know, in the Old Testament, the tithe, <coughs> the tithe was... <coughs> excuse me. The tithe was uh, the oxen, and the tithe was the sheep. That was their tithe. And they'll make fun of it like, do you expect me to bring my sheep in here and give it to my pastor? Just, you know, bring in just a line of oxen and all my grain in here, my new wine. Is that what you expect me to bring in? And they, 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 this is, this is just this oversimplification of the Bible anyways. Yeah, of course they brought their tithe, but... <coughs> I want you to look with me at Deuteronomy 14. And the Bible explains this. We should all understand this. You know, it's just, all it is, is it's just like gold. Gold has this value that we have set intrinsically. And we'll set gold there and we'll say, hey, that's worth this. So it has a certain value in a society. Right? Well, that value can also be represented by an oxen. That oxen would have a certain value. And it may have the exact same value of one piece of gold depending on the size of it. So this idea of like, oh, it's not money, it's not... You don't even understand really the concept of currency and what we do even with gold and with money. What, you do, what we do with money is we set that aside. Like a, we have what's considered a fiat currency to be exact in the United States of America. That supposedly represents the gold and then the, the government says we'll back this if anything ever happens. They basically say we'll, we'll take because they you know, have taken all the gold, which is not right. But they've taken all the gold and then they give up a promise. And I'm, you know, I'm sure you know, no, no government has ever let anybody down. Like, hey, if anything happens, we'll back the, if, if something goes uh, bad about this, right? So that's how money works. We just say, hey, this has value. But in societies, oxen will have a certain value. And it will change depending upon demand. Right? This is simple economics. So it doesn't matter whether it's gold or it's an oxen. Goods and services have value. And if we choose to use money in place of that, it's the same stinking thing. There's no difference. And the Bible even teaches this as well. It's a very basic concept. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 14, verse number 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed <coughs> that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy, <coughs> thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn of thy wine, of thine, of thine uh, oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Notice tithing causes you to fear God too. I want you to notice that. It causes you, you know why? Because it causes you to trust the Lord. Because you have to trust God in order to give the first fruits. Because it's the first that you give to Him. <coughs> And if the way be too long for thee, that's like, hey, if you live in Dan or Beersheba, if you live far from, from Judah or Jerusalem specifically, and if the way be too long for thee so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee... <clears throat> Then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. So notice that there is an equivalency of the possessions or of the goods that they have. There's an equivalency with money. 
And then they could turn that into money, but guess what? It's exactly the same. It's the same. It's just that they have a different value. Or they have the same value. It's just in a different form. That's all that it is. Because when, if the money was to be given directly to the Levite, which it's not for a particular reason, but if the money was to be given directly to the Levite, he would just go purchase all of the same items. It's the same thing. And I don't know how people don't understand this because it really is a silly, bad argument. So notice that he, they, he allowed them to turn it into money. But when they get there, they are going to be partaking of the goods. So then they take that money and turn it back into whatever they want. And, and recently when I did the debate, I actually explained this passage because people will try to use this passage to say, Hey, you know, you drink of the wine and the strength, on the strong drink. This is the tithe. And the Bible is extremely clear that the tithe, when it comes to the drink offering, you do not drink. It always tells you every time, there's not a single verse in the Bible one time ever that tells you to drink the drink offering. Ever. Not once. Ever. So if somebody believes that, that's a private interpretation and you're just believing something the Bible doesn't say. You're speaking when the Bible doesn't say that. You're assuming that they drank of this. Now, and what's interesting is if you look in Nehemiah, when it, when it tells you, this is very interesting. When it tells you the one time that it actually teaches that the wine of the, of the tithe that they're going to be putting up for the tithe, it calls it new wine every single time. Do you know what that is? Fresh wine which is very often times in the Bible, most of the time, referring to a non-alcoholic beverage. It's unfermented grape juice is what it is. It's unfermented wine. And what they use is they try to use verse 26, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. Now when it's saying thy soul desireth and thy soul lusteth after, it's saying you can choose out of your own volition. Whatever you desire inwardly, he's saying I'm not mandating that you turn it back into what you had before. That's the point. That's why he says, whatsoever you desire, whatsoever you want to get, I'm leaving it up to you. When you turn what you had, let's say that you're only, let's say that you only had wheat harvest and all your oxen burned up and all you had was wheat. That's possible. You're going to tithe of whatever increase you had. Well, you can turn that into money, travel to Jerusalem, because it's not practical to bring all of that there. Turn it into money, travel to Jerusalem. Once you get there, you can buy whatever you want. Whatsoever thy soul desireth. That's what it means. Whatever you want to get, I'm not mandating that it has to all be weed again. You don't have to turn it back into what you had before. That's the point. That's all that it means. It's saying whatever you desire, whatever you want to choose, that's what you can choose. This is not teaching that you can drink alcohol. There's not a single verse in the Bible that tells you you can drink an alcoholic beverage. And I'm positive that everybody here understands what I mean when I say alcoholic beverage. An intoxicating beverage. So... Uh, right here, we see in Deuteronomy chapter number 14, <coughs> we see that money is the same. Let me ask you this question, Mr. Smarty Pants. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, when it's what does it do? It compares the holy things that the Levites partook of to what? The things that they would be partaking of there. Spiritual things and carnal things. If I asked you, what is he talking about when he says carnal things, what would you say? Money. Wouldn't you probably say that? Well, he compares what the Levites partook in and what the ministers in the New Testament partook in. So you know what he's comparing? According to you, money and then the tithe of the Old Testament. Because it's the same. That's why the tithe can be turned into money. It's exactly the same. All it is is a way to support the ministers. It's a foolish, it's an overly simplified argument and it's foolish and stupid. The purpose was to support them. That's all that it was, and it's the same purpose in the New Testament. It's very simple. It's very obvious. And notice that Nehemiah got mad when they weren't waiting in the Old Testament, when they weren't able to be at the, at the tabernacle because he wanted a full-time minister. Right? It's sad, and in any case, our church is too small right now, but it's sad if there is a church somewhere where nobody ties and nobody gives because they don't believe in it, and they don't believe in the pastor working full-time, and they could, the pastor actually could work full-time, but they don't because they don't tithe. That's not a biblical teaching. That's the Lord's number one. You're sinning against God and you're stealing it. God desires for there to be full-time ministers and you would be blessed more, my friend, because then your pastor would be able to spend more time sowing spiritual things. And what do you think he should just spend all of his time working? I'm not talking about myself right now, so don't think I'm speaking as a man, right? You think that this man should spend all of his time laboring and working and trying hard to feed you spiritually, but it's like, oh, I shouldn't be paying him. You're a stinking greedy jerk is what you are. That's what's going on there, seriously. That's what's happening. 
It's like, don't you, it's, what it is is this too. It's because people don't put a high value on spiritual things. Right. They, they think, oh, this pastor's just preaching. I think it's more important. Right. I think it's more important than the money that you pay. That's what I think. I, when I, even when I would attend a church, I believe that what the pastor is doing, that what is coming out of his mouth, if we were to make an equivalency just like the money and the oxen and all that, that the words that are coming out of his mouth, the work that he does, that's more important than the money that you put in the plate. Amen. That's what I believe. That, that, there's a reason why I chose to spend my life as a minister of God because I believe that's the, the most important profession that there is. I believe that that is what we should do. And, and look, you don't have to work for the church to do that. You can be a minister of God and just soul in all the time and spend your time serving God in other areas as well. But I wanted to do the most that I could for God because I see a very high value in that. Much higher. And, and what, what people are doing is they think that what he's doing is not that important. The, the spiritual things are down here and carnal things are way up here in value. That's a bunch of crap. That's, that's, that is an ungodly view of the importance of the local New Testament church and the job of the minister of God. Nehemiah was angry that they weren't bringing their tithe in so that they weren't able to work full time and it caused them to be, have to go out there and work in the field. I hope that, all, I wish that all you know, great pastors and great men of God <coughs> were able to serve full time in the ministry. And as soon as our church gets big enough, immediately. And I'll, and even <coughs> if we get to where it's kind of close and I have to cut down our lifestyle of living and have to cut things out, whatever it may be, I'll do that and we'll eat rice and beans and I'll work full time for the church. Amen. That's more important to me. Much more important than the carnal things in my life. I've even talked to my wife about that so she's prepared if something like that happens. Not exactly rice and beans every day, but if I, you get the point. If I have to make economic cuts so that I make a lot less money, but I could possibly work for the church and get by and retain our health you know, by the foods we're eating and all of that, I'll do that because that's how important it is and I believe it's important and I want to serve full-time in the ministry. And God wants people to. That's the purpose of the tithe. The tithe is a doctrine that transcends the Old Covenant. That's why they gave it to the priest, even in the Old Testament. Uh, scriptures I'm referring to, Melchizedek. You know what he is? He's the priest of the New Covenant. This is his house. You should bring it to his house to support the ministers. It's your way of giving it to God. And you are giving the tenth unto him. If you don't give it to him, you're robbing him. And God will bless you more so if you paid him. Now I'm going to give you a closing application. Let's go ahead and turn to... I'm missing a page here. And that's why. And this is extremely important. Can somebody please... Jessica, go in there and see if that other page came out. Or just give me the scripture off of that last one. I believe it's in Leviticus. So go ahead and turn to Leviticus, please. <clears throat> the book of Leviticus. What is that passage? Levitic, the book of Leviticus. Go to Leviticus 27. It may be Leviticus 27. <clears throat> okay, that's it. <clears throat> hey, no women are allowed to speak in the church. No, I'm just kidding. Leviticus chapter number 27. Look at verse number... <clears throat> Look at verse 31. <coughs> So, <laughs> this is where he's giving specifics about the tithe. I'll give you a closing application that we can learn from. And he, and he, and he gives you... He, 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 God's very particular about a lot of things when you study commandments and the way God wants things to work. And he was very particular about the tithe. Uh, very particular about the tithe. And I, I always wondered about this, of what spiritual truth we could bring from this little detail that he had. It says in verse 31, it says, And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. Verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd, or of the flock, even of whatsoever, watch this, passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Notice that it shall be holy, it's set apart unto the Lord. And what he means by pass under the rod is they just set up a rod, and they just get all the animals to go under the rod, and what they do is <coughs> one out of every ten, Right? They, they're taking one-tenth. But he's very specific about what this one-tenth is to be. Look at what it says in verse 33. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it, 
And if he change it at all, then both, both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not, oh I'm sorry, it shall not be redeemed. Then he tells you verse 34. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Now, I worded that a little bit differently, but what takes place here? This is why it's called the first fruits. This is why it's called the firstlings. So what he does is he sets up the rod and what happens is the tenth of them, the first tenths that go through. That's, how, that's why they're called the firstlings. It's a, a, a percentage and it's one-tenth of everything that goes through. But he's very careful to say that it's the first. It's the firstlings. So you break them all into a percentage, let them go through, and the first tenth is what is going to go to God. This is very particular. That's why I said it's called the firstlings. That's why it's called the first fruits. That's why of the ten cities, which was the, the, the city that they arrived at and conquered first? Jericho. And which city went to God? The first one. Now, there's a, there's a point in here where he talks about, hey, you're not gonna, I don't want you to change it for good or bad. That means that if it's, if it's not the best ones, then then don't go try to find me the best ones and give those to me. But he's also saying if it's not the worst, you know, then, then don't go and try to find the worst because somebody who's being greedy, probably people that don't like tithing in the New Testament, they would go out and like say, hey, you get these, God, right? So he's saying don't switch it out for the worst and don't switch it out for the best. And I always thought like, why wouldn't we give God the best? Like, there's principles that you can learn from this. Why doesn't he want the best? And I thought about this a lot and I'll tell you why. It's very specific to be the first. It's the first city. It's the firstlings. It's the first fruits. It's very specific to be the first. And I'll tell you the good principle that we learn from this. And what God is teaching is that God comes first. Is that God, when you tithe to God, when you give the tenth percent unto God, you know what you got to do? You got to give it, you got to give him the, the first percent. And you know what that takes? It takes faith. That's why. It's a lot easier to pay your bills first. And then if you, at the end, have 10% left, then pay God. It's a lot easier to look at everything and say, Oh, I, I, you know, I can afford it, so let's just go ahead and give them the 10th. You know, like I said, when I set up my formula, when I, when I tithe, I immediately set up the formula first that that's what came out first. And oftentimes, that's what people do is they look around. God overall, the most important thing in the Bible is God wants us to trust Him and live by faith. That's the biggest that's the, the, the biggest focus of all characteristics. That's what God loves. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. God wants you to trust Him. And you know what it takes to, to give Him the first tenth? And to give Him the first? And to give Him precedence? Number one, you're saying, I, your sacrifice, you're saying He's more important. He comes first. You, 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 know, you shouldn't be worrying about, am I going to be able to feed my family with what I'm going to have left? What is it? The wor what if it's just all the worst and I'm going to have to kill all of them because they're not healthy? Or what if something happens after I give him the, turn th the tenth that I lose all of my money? What if, you know, uh, you know, it's not enough to feed us? Do you know what God says? Give me the first. First you give it to me. Don't switch it out for good or bad. The most important thing is those that go under the tenth, I want the firstlings. And the point is this. God comes first. God should come first in your life. God should be the first one. Even when it comes to our tithe, we should trust in the Lord and we should pay Him the tenth first because it's God's. The increase that you have, God's the one, God is the one that blessed you. God's the one that gives you what you have and allows you to get by anyways. The very least you could do. It's all of His anyways, but He chose to say, I've heard people say that, well, it's all God's, that's silly. No, God says the tenth is His. Okay, so that is a silly, yeah, of course, all of it's His, but He chose to say, of your increase that I've entrusted you with, of all of it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that a tenth of it you need to give to me, and that's holy unto me, and it is the Lord's. The Bible's the one that says the tenth is the Lord's. So God, God is the one that blessed you to have all of it, and He says 10% 10, 10 of that is mine. Is 10% is to give to God too much? I mean, come on. For everything God's done to me, I know that me, I'm, I'm grateful enough that 10% does not sound like that much. Right. And a lot of times it comes from a greedy heart where people don't want to do that. Now, uh, I'd like to conclude with, with that point and then, and then also uh, one other thing in tandem. I'm finished right now. Restating, God comes first. That's the principle we learn overall from the tithe. 
It is the Lord's. Give it to Him. God comes first in all areas of our life. We can apply that all the way across the board. And if you struggle with this, it's probably that you struggle trusting God or maybe you're greedy, whatever it may be. It's one of those things in your life and, it, and wherever you're at in life, I don't know, but it's what, what comes out is that God comes first and we need to trust the Lord that He'll get us by. That should be the conclusion in our mind. And in and all of our increase, we need to give to the Lord. That's how we should live our lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for uh, um, just, a, just giving us so many, giving us an increase. Just uh, all the blessings that we have in our life. Help us to have the right heart when it comes to this doctrine and so many others and, and uh, uh, not to, to loosen up and liberalize on, on, on all these doctrines that are you know, very clear in the Bible. Even though you have to do some study, it's, it, it, like many things, it becomes very clear when you compare Scripture with Scripture. We love you so much and be with us and bless our church, dear God. Uh, bless us in spiritual ways as opposed to uh, financial ways primarily, dear God. Just give us a spiritual blessing. Help us to, to bless others spiritually. Help us to grow spiritually as individuals and also as a church. We love you so much, as I said. Be with every individual that was here, dear God. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>